Kenya's president, William Ruto, said this week that there was a plot to murder the country's top electoral office last official last August to prevent them from announcing Ruto as the winner of the presidential election. This was the first time the president has mentioned the plot after months of rumors on social media and Ruto's supporters are urging an investigation. Mohamed Yusuf reports from Nairobi, Nairobi, Kenya. President Ruto made the allegation at the State House Tuesday as he met with outgoing commissioners of Kenya's Independent Electoral and Boundaries Commission, including outgoing Chairman Wafula Chabukati. Last August, Chabukati declared Ruto as winner of Kenya's presidential election, which Ruto won by a narrow margin over his main challenger, Raila Odinga. Ruto alleged that unnamed individuals plotted to kill the IEBC chairman and take other steps so the election results could not be announced. The mechanism constituted a syndicate to execute a series of strategies consisting of bribery, blackmail, extortion, threats and intimidation of various public officials of the IEBC, attempt their abduction, torture and assassination, to storm the National Tallying Center and attempt Tucson's insurrection. Rumors about efforts to disrupt the election have circulated on social media for months, but police have yet to open an investigation. Opposition parties say if Ruto has evidence about a plot, he should order police to investigate. The head of the former ruling Jubilee Party, Jeremiah Kioni, says those suspected of threatening the electoral commissioner's lives must be charged. The unfortunate allegations coming from a head of state. If he had evidence, he should have used the, the agencies that have been charged with the criminal justice system to ensure that uh, those culpable are um, dealt with by the institutions and, and as provided for uh, in our laws. Many Kenyans see Ruto's allegations are plausible. Chris Musando, a Kenyan official in charge of ICT, was kidnapped and killed a few days before the 2017 election. That killing is still unsolved. However, Political commentator Martin Andati says Ruto is making a mistake by bringing attention to the alleged plot to kill Chebukati. He's opening a Pandora's box because uh, you remember that late Musando was abducted and eventually killed, and Kenyans have not forgotten. So they, they, are, they are creating, you know, the country had started healing, and you saw the reception uh, President Ruto received in Luanyanzi. But when he now starts making the kind of allegations he's making and opening the wounds which had started healing, then uh, we will get derailed. We will not be able to heal as a country. We will not be able to address some of the challenges that uh, he needs to address. And we are likely to lose focus. Ruto won the August election by less than 2% points over Odinga and four members of the seven-member IEBC challenged official results in court. The Supreme Court upheld the final count. Kenya now faces months without an electoral commission after the terms of the last three remaining commissioners, including the chairperson, ended this week. The departing commissioners have recommended the commissioners be appointed to the electoral body two years before the election, strengthening electoral laws and improving security at the tallying centers in the country. Kenya has appointed electoral commissioners through the Interparties Parliamentary Group since 1997. The opposition anticipates that a similar approach will be used in the formation of a new election agency. Mohamed Yusuf for VA News, Nairobi. Millions of Nigerians are at risk of facing hunger between June and August 2023, the lean season, if urgent action is not taken. The figures were in the October 22 Kadru Harbonis, a government-led and UN-supported food and nutrition analysis carried out twice a year. UNICEF says it is working with the government and aid organizations to invest in scaling up preventative nutrition interventions while ensuring that vulnerable children have life-saving nutrition services. Douglas Sampuga reached Namai Hajibhoi, UNICEF's chief of section for nutrition in Nigeria, to find out more about the situation. 
As you know, Nigeria has approximately 200 million and some people, and the Kadri Harmonize report, it's, it's an estimation um, done in October 2022. And as for the data, it shows that about 17 million um, Nigerians are at risk of facing, you know, of, of food insecurity. And that number is projected to increase during what we call the lean season in um, Nigeria, which happens usually between June, July, August, September. Uh, so there will be about 25 million Nigerians who will be affected um, and not know where the next meal is coming from. So it is pretty serious. Uh, of those um, many, many people, the main age group that will be affected are young children under the age of five. And as you know, that you know, young children are exceptionally vulnerable to shocks of food and food insecurity and can get malnourished really easily and then will need uh, life-saving nutrition services. Is this food security and nutrition situation same throughout Nigeria or it's more serious in some parts of the country? Um, so I would say it is spread this report or this analysis was done across 26 states, including the Federal Capital Territory. Um, and when you look at the data, of course, you have states which, which may have higher populations that are more affected in terms of numbers. But it is quite spread through the country, um, including in cities like Lagos, where you have urban poverty that affects large numbers. So of the 17 million or 25, of the 17 million, one can see that almost 1.5 million will be in Lagos. A large number will be in states that uh, have been facing a protracted or longer crisis. So the Northeast states are also affected. What would you attribute uh, this dire situation to? What's the biggest factor? Um, so, uh, you know, I, it's always hard to say that this is the main factor because a situation like this is always the result of multiple factors. But I'd say the three most critical factors in this, this time period have been the lagging effect of COVID. As you know, during the COVID pandemic, access to food and access to livelihoods was severely affected, uh, depriving a lot of people of income and leading to all kinds of issues. We're seeing now the lagging effect of COVID in many, many countries. So the COVID-19 pandemic and coming out of it, we're seeing uh, climate change that has also affected Nigeria. I think about 28 of our 36 states experienced floods last year. This has affected harvest and the availability of food, leading to increasing food prices. We've also seen inflation uh, overall. Uh, the price of, let's say, agricultural inputs have increased uh, several fold in the span of 12 months, again, raising the price of food uh, in the market. And that coupled with, you know, conflict that we're seeing in the country, uh, slightly more increasing incidences. So I would say it's a, it's, it's a combination of COVID, climate, conflict, uh, inflation. Uh, those, I would say, are the predominant factors. What ought to be done? What should be done in the short term or in the long term to uh, remedy the situation? So I would say, you know, we're lucky that we're able to get data and that we have this projection. So boss of mine would always say good news is bad news come early. So we have this news with us now as government uh, partners, as the UN, as other humanitarian and development actors in civil society. So we need to come together and act. Um, acting means being, we you know, this is going to happen so we can put into place systems or activities or things that will help to prevent uh, families from plunging into food insecurity. For example, we could scale up the cash transfers that are available or food assistance is provided. We could also prepare ourselves to respond, show timeline shift and, you know, issues start to begin to be seen earlier. That was Neamet Hajib Hoy, Chief of Section Nutrition to UNICEF in Nigeria. She spoke with Douglas Mpuga from Abuja. 
And in more news from Nigeria, the French news agency AFP reports that Nigerian security officials have rescued the last two hostages from a train station kidnapping earlier this month. Twenty people were abducted in the attack at the station in the southern state of Edo. Seven people, including two local traditional chiefs, have been detained in connection with the attack. Insecurity is expected to be an issue ahead of February's election for a new president to replace President Mohamedou Buhari. Heavily armed bandits are behind most of the Reuters news service, President Akinumi Adisena says the top five performing countries in Africa could grow by more than 5.5%. Two countries with large natural gas projects, Senegal and Mozambique, are projected to grow by over 8% next year. But two of the continent's largest economies, Nigeria and South Africa, expected to grow between 1.5% to 3%. The inflation rate is expected to drop to close to 9%, four points lower than last year. The bank notes that the continent is recovering from the rising inflation and food prices and tightening monetary policy in wealthy countries, which has driven up the cost of serving growing debt. Those conditions led to a drop last year in African growth to 3.8% from nearly 5% in 2021. When Pope Francis travels to the Democratic Republic of Congo and South Sudan in a week and a half, he will not only hold prayer services and meet with political leaders, he also plans to talk to ordinary African Catholics. The church is seeing its fastest growth in Africa. Out of 1.36 billion Catholics, 236 million are African. Stan Chuilo, Religious scholar and professor at DuPaul University in Chicago, author of the book Handbook of African Catholicism, says the Pope will particularly want to hear from young people and women on controversial topics such as the future of the church, marriage, and celibacy. He tells VOA's Carol Van Dam it's part of a worldwide consultation the pontiff began last year that will wrap up in 2024 called the Synodal Process. In November the 1st, I organized with three other dicasteries at the Vatican a virtual meeting between over 3,000 African young people and Pope Francis. So we organized this with the Dicastery for communication for the evangelization of peoples and then the uh, Commission on the Synod as well as the Pontifical Council on uh, uh, Commission on Latin America. So the Pope was very, very animated during that conversation. It was meant to be an hour. We spent an hour, 30 minutes. So the Pope is going to meet these young people, some representatives in person, he met with them virtually in November. So he's going to meet with them uh, in person in Kinshasa. Pope Francis believes that the future of Africa will be determined by the young people. Perhaps it's also a strategic uh, approach because for those who've been, you know, smelted in the furnace of conservatism, the uh, hardcore conservatives in the continent, uh, some of them high-ranking church officials who've been on for the last 40 years, you're not going to change them in the next in the next one year or two. And the young people are the ones who are very vibrant. In uh, 20, 2018, uh, they had this um, synod on young people. So it's, it's actually a very strategic move by the Pope to look at Africa through the lens of young people. In, in South Sudan, it's more ecumenical. So it's an ecumenical visit rather than, say, the Pope making an official visit. Yes, it's an official visit to South Sudan, but he is going to be there with other church leaders. In Congo, uh, the issue also of clerical sexual abuse is uh, front and center because February last year, the Bishops' Conference of Congo had published this document. What about the Catholic conservatives? What are they, where are they in this picture with Pope Francis, who seems to be far more liberal leaning than the previous popes? 
Yes, this is the contradiction of the times that a few years back, Cardinal Sarah, the, the former head of the um, congregation, now the Dicastery for Sacred Worship, he, he was the most high-ranking church uh, official from Africa. He's from Guinea, and he is considered like the, the lion of the conservative group, not only in Africa, but he, he crisscrosses uh, the United States. Canada. He's a, he's a constant visitor here with the conservatives. I mean, the last controversy was really the work on celibacy during the synod on the, on, on, on the Amazon. Sarah will epitomize, really, the kind of conservatism that you see in the continent of Africa. That's uh, Stan Chuilo, religious scholar and professor at DuPaul University in Chicago. He was speaking with my colleague, Carol Van Dam. United Nations peacekeepers have found nearly 50 bodies in mass graves in Ituru province in eastern DRC. Authorities blame the death on attacks by Lindu militias from Kodeko, the Alliance for the Liberation of the Congo. The French news agency AFP reports 42 people, including 12 women and 6 children, were found in the village of Niamamba, while the bodies of 7 men were found in the village of Imbogi. The UN is calling for an investigation into whether the attacks are linked and for the perpetrators to be brought to justice. AFP notes that Ituru province, which borders Uganda, has seen an uptick in violence in recent weeks. And that wraps up this edition of African News Tonight. I'm Yehiyas Wuhib in Washington. For all the latest developments on the continent 24-7, visit our website at voaafrica.com. On behalf of our producer, Nicole Beckford, and our engineer, Adrius Regas, thanks for choosing the Voice of America. 